My name is Cyrus. I'm a, uh, I'm a postdoc uh, at University of Chicago, and I did my uh, PhD in programming languages. Uh, I finished last year at CMU. And um, I'm really excited about the future of programming environments. I think I'm, there's a lot of optimism about what's going on in that area. There's a lot of cool ideas being put out on how programming environments can help us uh, answer questions that we have while we're programming, how programming environments can help us save time, save a lot of the effort that we need to do the kind of boilerplate stuff that I think is really annoying, that, that takes up a lot of the time uh, that, that we use when we're programming and prevents us from doing the kind of stuff that we really want to do, uh, solving the problems that we want to solve, addressing some of the big challenges in society that we want to address. And so um, I'm, I'm going to present some work today, uh, which is all kind of wrapped up in this project called Hazel, um, which is really exploring sort of the, the future of how programming should feel. And what Hazel is, is an, it's an experimental programming environment. It's quite experimental right now. Um, that, that's really trying to examine the theoretical foundations, the semantic foundations for those feelings that we want to have. So a programming environment is a user interface. And on one side of that interface is obviously a programmer, or in some cases, many programmers. Uh, working together maybe on the same screen, maybe on, on, at different computers. Um, but what's on the other side of that interface, right? What are these two programmers here interacting with? So the naive answer might be a program, right? But in fact, most, in most programming environments today, that's not quite true most of the time. Um, in fact, we're mostly just interacting with text. And not all pieces of text are programs, unless you're using APL, which this cat is using. <laughs> to become a program, a piece of text has to run quite a gauntlet. Right? You have to first parse it, it comes to parse tree, and you type check it, get a type tree, and then you run it, and you hope it doesn't crash, pre crash prematurely before it gets to the part of the program that you're actually working on or you're interested in so that you can actually interact with that program. And um, on each leg of this gauntlet, some text doesn't make it, make it to the next leg. And the implications of this are that the various features, the various language services that your programming environment um, provides to you through various user interfaces, um, these language services, they rely on these intermediate representations. And when, they're not, when you don't get to that leg of the gauntlet, you don't get these programming services available to you. For example, say you've written this uh, um, text into your, into, your, into your editor. Well, you haven't put anything to the right of the plus. It's not well formed, and so it's just text. And the only services you have available to you are the text edit services, text edit actions that your you know, your editor provides you with. Um, so that so 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 you know this maybe you're just a, this is maybe a very temporary state. You're just about to type the thing to the right of the plus, and so it's just a you know a few hundred milliseconds between when, when this is true. But there are other situations where your program can be malformed for quite a bit of time. For example, if you're doing a, a big case analysis, you might write this and start filling in the first case or whichever case you'd like and leave the other ones blank. And from the perspective of the grammar of the programming language, this is probably not well formed. Um, and so again, you don't get any of the editor services while you're doing this potentially very complicated task. Um, so I'll talk about workarounds for in a second, but I just wanted to make that point. Um, even if you have a well formed program, say to the right of the plus, you've written F because again, you're about to apply F, but in that very moment, it's just uh, the variable f, which has function type. Well, it's well formed. The parser's happy with it, but the type checker's not happy with it, because you can't add functions to, to numbers, right? So um, you'll get some of these editor services, like syntax highlighting, auto formatting, various context-free tree transformations. Um, but um, you won't get any of the editor services that require semantic understanding of your program. Again, this might be really temporary, but there's other situations where it might take a little longer before you get to the next next leg of the journey, right? You might just specify function f and you haven't defined it yet, and that might take a little while before that's done. And then there's some situations where it takes a long time before you get back to a complete program. Think of a large-scale refactoring. You change some really fundamental type definition in your program, and all of a sudden, hundreds of errors pop up in your program, and you spend two weeks going and, and, and changing all those, all those definitions that you wrote. Well, for two weeks, you're not going to have these editor services available to you. Um, and then finally, let's say you have a well-typed program. Well, typically that means you can run it, but 
you might not be able to run it as far as you'd like because maybe you've kind of just like worked around some of these limitations by raising unimplemented in a certain point in your program. And so anything after that point in the program evaluation, you'll never get to. And so any live programming services that you want to use in that part of the program won't be available to you, right? So it's like you don't, you don't get the full assortment of, of language services in your programming environment unless you have a complete program, and for the live programming stuff, one that doesn't fail prematurely before you really wanted it to fail, or, or end at least, right? So, um, so this, we call this the gap problem uh, because there's these gaps where you can have failure occur and then you get these gaps in service. So let me put that in words real quick. The gap problem is that language services flicker out or report, sometimes they'll report stale information from previous editor states when the program is incomplete. And so I want to talk real quick about um, an approach that sort of is a partial solution to the gap problem, which is typed holes. And what they do is, is they allow you to like, decrease the number of editor states that are, that are ill-formed or ill-typed by putting in holes instead of leaving, leaving spots blank. Um, and so there's a number of languages uh, and eco language ecosystems now that are kind of adopting typed holes in, uh, in both the language and in the, uh, the um, programming environments for that language. So for example, in GHC Haskell, you can use this underscore to the right of the plus, for example, and now it's a well-formed term. And it's also well-typed because underscore is kind of typed like raising an exception. Um, you can do the same thing with that case analysis example. You can give typed holes names. So if you put some uh, identifier there after the underscore, that's the name of the hole. Um, similarly, in this map example. And then um, the uh, programming environment, say Emacs, um, that, that you're using will uh, report the information that the compiler produces, which tells you that you have a hole. It tells you what, what its type is. Uh, and in Haskell, it tells you some other things. Um, and then it'll, it'll, it'll sometimes tell you, so it'll suggest some things to you. So there's some really cool work going on in, on uh, whole, whole suggestions. For example, it'll, here it just tells you that there's some relevant bindings like K and plus in scope in this example. And so, yeah, you're getting some nice, actually, like editor services that know about the types of things here, even though your program has these blank spots in them, but they're not blank anymore, so it's OK. Um, and so there's, a, there's other um, programming uh, systems that have the same feel to them. One, thing, one that I want to talk about is Agda. This is the one that I was using when I started really thinking about holes and um, I was doing some proofs. And uh, what Agda has, it has these kind of uh, these empty holes that I just showed you from Haskell, and it also has these non-empty holes. So Agda is a, this is a dependently typed programming language. People use it as a proof assistant. Um, and, uh, you can, when you don't quite know what you want to do, but you know that you're going to use a variable like IH, that's the induction hypothesis in this proof, um, you can put it in this thing called a non-empty hole with, between these curly braces. And uh, Agda knows how to parse that and knows how to type check that, and it gives you some type information. It tells you what the goal type of that hole, of that hole is, the type of the hole. And it tells you the type that you actually have of this expression in the hole. And you can kind of like look at those and see what the difference is and try to figure out how to fill the hole in the right way. And then you also get this context information about what's in scope. These are sort of the assumptions that you currently have in the, that point in your proof. So um, yeah, so Agda has really good support for this. A lot of other dependently typed proof assistants have, uh, have similar features, Idris and a number of others. Um, and so you know, typed holes let you, like I said, they're, they're a partial solution. So like you could still write this, and this will still not parse in GHC, for example, not well, in, in whatever language this is, right? And, uh, um, but if you find yourself in this situation, you can spend a little bit of your time before you get to the, the thing you're, you're, you're trying to think about next, putting a few underscores in. Maybe that doesn't take that much time, and now it'll parse. Um, maybe this isn't quite well typed yet, though, uh, because maybe x isn't a, a type that has these cases. And so you can use these non-empty holes in, in Agda, for example, and, and put the, the x in this non-empty hole. And now it'll type check, and you'll get some, a lot of nice editor services at that point. Um, as far as running the program, um, typically you can't run programs that still have holes in them. The compiler treats them as a compiler error. Uh, there, is a, there is a feature in GHC that allows you to uh, pass in a flag, defer typed holes, and uh, it'll run the program, but it'll kind of treat each, each of these holes as uh, raised unimplemented. It'll, it'll crash as soon as you get to that uh, first hole that you see. So it's kind of a partial solution to, to running the program, but it doesn't solve that problem of like getting edit live editor services at points in the program that you don't necessarily reach through that uh, protocol. So 
what Hazel is, is an attempt to really, it's, it's a whole-oriented approach, but it tries to really do an end-to-end -end solution to this gap problem, so that throughout the process of programming, you have a live typed program with holes in it. Uh, you never have just some text. You never have just a, a parse tree without a type tree. And you never have something that stops prematurely because it hit one of these holes. And the key, so, um, so what that implies is that all of these editor services are available at every moment that you're using Hazel. There isn't one millisecond where one of these editor services is off or uh, somehow using some heuristics or something like that to kind of partially stay on, which some advanced programming environments do. And the key idea behind this is that instead of making um, text edit actions the primary way you edit programs, we have this language of structural uh, edit actions and they're type aware. Um, and so, so Hazel is a, a structure editor. There's many different names for this projectional editor, structured editor, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I don't really like any of those phrases because as you'll, as you'll see in my demo in a second, I really try to want, I, I'm really making the Hazel UI try to feel as much like these existing things that I just showed you, feel like text. And I really want you to think about it as just automatic hole insertion, right? Instead of having to go do it yourself, the programming environment always puts it in for you, it saves you time, and it, it gives you this end-to-end -end guarantee that there's no gaps in this, uh, in, in this pipeline. Um, so I want to switch to a demo real quick. Um, oh, this is going to be a little tricky because I have to look at this screen. Okay, so this is the Hazel UI. Like I said, Hazel is experimental. The language of Hazel is the simply typed lambda calculus with um, a few extensions. So a, a, a very popular, very practical programming language, in my opinion. And uh, um, what you start with is a hole, and each hole has a, uh, a name. In, in the Hazel UI, we just use numbers for names. So this is hole one. Let me zoom in a little bit. Is this? Is that okay? Can everyone see that in the back? Yeah. Okay, so you start with hole one, and your cursor's on it. And um, you can start typing two plus. So if I type two plus, uh, you don't get a parse error. You don't get any sort of um, weird intermediate like error recovery thing going on. It just inserts a hole for you right there in the program, hole two. And, and you can see that the result, there's a result computed and there's a type computed. There says result of type num and the result is two plus hole two. The colon one means instance one of hole two. I'll show you examples of programs where you get multiple instances of a single hole from the source program in a second. And if you look at the, uh, at the top right there, there's this thing called the, the type inspector and it tells you that at the current cur cursor position where you're in a hole there, expecting something of type num, and you're getting something of a consistent type question mark. And so there's actually holes in types as well in Hazel. And we use this notion of type consistency, which comes from the work on gradual typing. Um, so gradual typing was sort of originated in, this, in the world of like untyped dynamic languages that you are slowly annotating. But here they are just come in very useful in this very different domain. Uh, of uh, editing programs and not just, just ha not having enough information to know what that hole is going to be filled with. Um, okay, so we can type two here and get our answer four. I didn't have to press enter or anything. It's evaluating on every edit. Um, now, um, my notes here. Um, so this, the, you know, so if, if, you, if you've seen structure editors before, this kind of thing might not be that that. Uh, that interesting, and I think the usual complaint is that didn't we try structure editors in the 80s, right? Like, and then they failed, and, and text turns out to be the best thing. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Like, I don't have data about Hazel for you, but uh, maybe we will one day. Um, but so we're doing some things from some more recent structure editors, like uh, MPS and Better, uh, to really make this structure editor thing feel more like automatic hole insertion and less like. AST transformations where you have to have a mental model of the AST and you're doing these local transformations. So for example, if I, if I go back here and I type times three, and then, so in, a, in an old school structure editor, if you, plus, if you press plus here, what that might mean is like transform the selected node into a plus node. And so you'd get like two plus parens three plus hole. Um, in Hazel, if you press plus, you get two times three plus hole, but it associates the way you would expect in, 
a normal pro a normal non Lisp programming language, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so it's doing this kind of dynamic. Uh, like every time that we represent operator sequences as just sequences, and where every time the sequence changes, they uh, it, uh, it does reassociation according to the usual order of operations and everything like that. Um, so um, yeah, so you can do things like delete the delete the plus, and it becomes uh, if I do plus four here. So if I yeah, so if I delete the plus and there's a hole there, well it's like well pretend nothing was there and just get rid of the whole plus. There's a four there, and I do delete the plus. Then it's just deleting the plus, and uh, uh, it's reassociating. So it's saying, "Oh, you tried to apply three as a function to four because that's how uh, that's how the precedence works." And if you go over to the three, you'll see that it's in this dotted red box, and that's a non-empty hole. So that's not just part of the user interface of Hazel. That's part of the semantics of Hazel. That red box. That's the non-empty hole that we assign meaning to. So you can see in the result, there's also a red box with a three on it, uh, with a three in it. And then there's some stuff. Those are casts. Um, I wanted to put a, a, a text box in right before the talk was given to, to hide those, but I thought I would actually mention them. As, as what's, what's actually going on here is if you look at the right sidebar up there, it says, expecting something of function type or in function position, got something of type num, but it's in a hole, so I'm going to treat it as this whole arrow hole kind of thing temporarily. And when you have holes in types, you can do weird things. This is from this gradual typing. You can start writing programs that have dynamic errors again. And so these things are the casts. They come from the cast calculus, which is part of the theory of gradual typing. And they're used to ensure type safety. They ensure that you don't get stuck. You'll actually get a, a, a cast failure. Um, but when a cast fails, it doesn't cause program execution to stop. Uh, it will actually kind of treat it as a dynamically generated hole and continue as if it was a, a, a static hole. So I, I'll skip actually showing that to you. It's not that interesting. I'll, I'll show you something else. Um, so I showed you evaluation of, of like sub-expressions, right? If you do two times three plus, you get six plus whole 14 instance one, right? So you're getting this computation of two times three is actually happening even though you have a hole there. Um, and that's, that's true even if you put the hole on, in, on the left side, right? So if you do this plus two times three, uh, you get whole 16 plus six as well, right? So it's not stopping, even, you know, assuming left to right evaluation of these things, it's not stopping because it sees whole 16. It's just kind of leaving it as this residual, it's an indeterminate, kind of expression that you can't um, case analyze on. But you can do other stuff elsewhere in the program, right? There's also maybe you have many tests that you're running and one of them has a hole or something in it. Why do you have to stop your, you know, why do you have to do something with a test runner? Very complicated, right? Just keep going. Um, let's see, one puzzled face. You can ask questions on Slido. Um, OK, and then um, I already showed you the type errors. There's also, you can also write down free variables. So if, for example, if I, so I can put a, a space here first if I want, but I don't have to. But if I put an, an F in there, it'll say, hey, there's nothing named F in your, in your context. Expecting something of function type, got this free variable F. Uh, but I'm treating it like it's a hole, just like with a non-empty hole. A non-empty hole is different than a free variable hole because a non-empty hole has something well typed in it, just maybe not of the right type. So it like reifies type inconsistencies. Free variable holes are similar, but they reify binding errors, like unbound variable errors. And the thing inside an unbound variable error is a free variable. It's not well typed because it's not in the context. OK. Um, all right, so let's actually do uh, show you some binding. So let's define this function f. And again, when I did a let, it put the holes in into the right place. And I'm going to make a, a lambda. And I'm going to make it like a num, arrow, num, arrow, num. And those are just infix operators there. And I can go uh, back to this hole here and maybe make another lambda and then do um, x plus y plus hole. OK, well, we're line wrapping there. My pretty printer's not that great right now, but. Um, and then let's apply that, that a couple of times. So let's call like f on. Um, 2 plus 2, oops, 2 plus 2, 
uh, three and call f on three plus three four. And then let's look at what, what's going on in, uh, in this hole at the end of the program here. Um, so the result isn't that interesting, right? It just says, well, this whole thing evaluates the hole 33, because you just did some bindings and then ended at a hole. There's nothing to put at the end. But if you look there at the sidebar, which I cannot see at all from here. OK, sorry. <laughs> um, so there's a, you have all the bindings in scope, right? You have f of this type, num, arrow, num, arrow, num. You have a of type num, b of type num. And you also have values for those bindings. So the value of f is this lambda, with an annotated lambda there. And then you have these, these computations that actually did the like 2 plus 2 and, and, and 3 and add the 4 plus 3, and you get that 7. Same thing with b. And then you get two instances of hole 27. Um, instance two and three. Instance one is the instance that's in the original function body. And so, um, yeah, so, you, so, so this is called, we're, we're doing what's called, what we call hole closure tracking. So when you're evaluating a hole, you don't just evaluate it as just like this symbol. Uh, you actually implicitly, uh, or like invisibly, I guess I want to say, the, there's a, uh, an environment that's associated with each hole. And when that hole's, being, when that hole's evaluated, it kind of captures the environment that that was there when that hole was evaluated. And you can go and, uh, oh boy. Where's my cursor? Upper right. Ah, I see it. OK. You can go and click on one of these if you want. And it'll take you to the corresponding uh, hole in the program. And now you'll see the context of that point in the program, where it's just x and y are bound of type num. And you'll see their values from that hole closure that you selected. Uh, so this is, this is the first closure, the first instance of hole 27, which was produced when, um, uh, from that first call that bound variable a. And you can, you can actually toggle between all the instances of, of the hole that are in the results. So you can start seeing all the values that came in to this hole and uh, that can help you con con concretely think about what values are coming into your function instead of just thinking abstractly in terms of what their type are, type is. And so assuming your types aren't like singleton types, this I think is quite useful. Um, and then, yeah, you can do the usual thing. Like you can fill this hole here at the end with like A plus B. And you'll see that those hole instances are now not in the sidebar anymore. You don't, get these whole, you don't get this whole closure information at all times because it, it, it's associated with the hole that you're currently in. And that's, that really that means that this, the overhead of this mechanism is far lower than like recording all calls to a function. It's only exactly the holes that you have in the program there's any recording going on. So there's no overhead when you have a complete program at all, right? Um, which that maybe has some downsides. You could, like, I think tracing is a, com a complementary mechanism to this. I wanted to say that. Anyway, so well, yeah, so you have these whole instances in the in the in the result now instead of in the sidebar, but you can do the same thing: click on them, toggle between them, and go back to the hole and see the, the closure information. Okay. So um, yeah, so that's all I want to kind of show you in the, in the Hazel UI. You can play with this thing. Oh, oh yeah, there's another thing I wanted to show you. Uh, if you hover over these infix operators, you'll see how they're, how they're being associated. I don't know how well that comes across on the screen, but like the darker the background there, the, the tighter the association. So we're really taking advantage of having a syntax tree information, and, and this could be useful when you have more complicated operators and things. OK, so now I want to go back to this. So yeah, so you can go to hazel.org and play with that. Um, we're doing, yeah, so, 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 so that language is, is very simple. It's a simply type lambda calculus. There's sums and numbers and things, but uh, it's not very usable. So our, our, um, our uh, uh, next step in terms of the implementation over the next, uh, hopefully, two months, three months, is to kind of uh, um, scale this up. We're targeting Elm or something very close to Elm, maybe, maybe Elm. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then you know, I think the the, the uh, this idea that we have for the UI is basically to make it as text-like as possible while maintaining this invariant about uh, uh, no gaps. And so, you know, that's not entirely it's not entirely text-like yet. 
but we're really working on it. And we have this, this idea of using holes in another way, which is if you do want to get completely out of the structure editing world for a, a little part of your program because you're doing something quite strange, then we, we have this idea of a text edit editing hole where you can select a node, turn it into a hole, and what's inside the hole is just some text. And then you have an action when you're done editing that text using text edit actions to turn it back into a structured program. And so it's not like you have to go into your other editor and edit the whole program in text and then come back. We want to do that very locally. It's not implemented yet, but we're working on it. We have a textual syntax for Hazel now, but it's not in the UI yet. Um, and uh, yeah, our goal um, is to use Hazel in some part of our teach. So I'm an academic, my, uh, I'm a postdoc, and my advisor Ravi at Chicago, and then my collaborator Matt at Boulder, they both teach int introduction to fun functional programming courses to, uh, to undergraduates. Uh, Ravi uses Elm and a little bit of Haskell, and, and Matt uses OCaml. And so we're, we're uh, giving some serious thought to using this for some part of that course. Um, initially, I think we're going to use it as the instructors of the course during lecture. Because often what you do when you're teaching, when you're, when you're going through an example is you're saying, okay, we've like gotten this far and we need to fill, what should we fill this hole in, in with? You know? and, I'll, and then you go, I'll wait. And then you wait for somebody to answer, right? And, uh, and they're just, their minds are usually just kind of blank and no one answers. And, uh, and so you can help them by pointing out that sidebar that says what the expected type is. And then you can ask them questions about what's in scope that might be of that type and things like that. So I think using it as a lecturer is kind of a nice uh, initial application. And then eventually we want them to actually use it in homework assignments and, and then down the line other applications that uh, probably a lot of you have in mind and are thinking of reasons why this could never work. <laughs> okay, my slides are cut off a little bit. I hope that's okay. Uh, it just says Q there on the left. So um, I want to give you a, f a feel of what this might look like once we have Elm implemented. Um, this isn't quite Elm, but it's almost Elm. Um, uh, so this is kind of a mock-up that we generated kind of an encoding of this program in, in, in Hazel and then like cleaned it up quite a bit to make it presentable. And so um, we're implementing quicksort here. And if you recall quicksort, it is uh, as a recursive function. It uh, takes a list and in the uh, empty case, it returns the empty list obviously. And then it, it picks the pivot as the head of the element in this case. And then it calls this partition function that like, turns that, the, the, the rest of the list into two lists, smaller and bigger, that contain the elements that are smaller and bigger than the pivot. Uh, and then um, you do recursive calls to sort those things. And then you got to do something to combine them. And so you're in this hole that's in the return position after you've done some like, recursive computations. And, uh, and at the bottom there, we've called quicksort on a little example list. Um, so again, the result of this computation, according to our little dynamic semantics, is just whole one. All that does is it confirms that we went through the recursive case of this function when we have non-empty input, which is a small piece of information, but not that interesting. Um, what's more interesting is that sidebar. And that sidebar shows you what the pivot is uh, on the sort of outermost recursive call there. It shows you what the tail of the list is x's. It shows you what the result of calling small uh, of the partition function is, smaller and bigger, and it shows you the result of the recursive calls, which again are just whole instances. But those whole instances are different instances. Well, instance, does that say two and three uh, instead of one? And you can click on instance three, for example, and and dive into that recursive call on the bigger list, um, and then you'll see this. The bigger list starts with six, and the rest of it is five and seven, and the recursive calls just give you five and seven. And then you'll see, okay, well, you're recursing on this one element list. What happens when you do that? Click again, and smaller this time, for example, and you'll see these base cases, and then you're kind of done. So you've, you've traced through this recursive computation, um, but you haven't done this tracing of like all function calls, because that would be kind of confusing, like which one of the like seven calls to this function were, was the call to like the, the, the Q sort bigger from the outer recursive call. You're just going to get like all the, all the data that was recorded and you, it requires some pretty sophisticated like debugging, stepping through the evaluation trace stuff to, to really understand this. All of this stuff that I'm showing you is all relative to the result 
The result contains a hole, and that hole has a, a, a closure, and in that closure is some other holes that themselves have closures, and we're just showing them this recursive closure structure to you um, sort of iteratively by, you know, or interactively in this sidebar. And so it's, it's a nice way, I think, to, to understand these recursive computations. Um, and uh, if you'll notice at the very bottom there, it, it tells you the path that you took. So if you forget what you clicked on, it says you started at hole 1, 1, uh, and then you selected hole 1, 2 from, which is somewhere in the R bigger uh, variable in that environment, in that closure, and then R smaller. So, you, so uh, you can actually kind of navigate back and forth. And, and again, this is something that I, I can imagine using as a, as a lecturer, but also maybe you can imagine using for something. OK, now for the terrifying bit. If we haven't been spending the last two years implementing Elm, if it is just the simply type lambda calculus with this kind of silly user interface, promising but silly user interface, um, what have we been doing? What we've been doing is we've been really working out the type theoretic foundations for everything that I just showed you. And so I'm not going to show you all the inference rules and all that stuff, but I just want to point out, like, this is what the simply type lambda calculus with holes, what's it, what its grammar looks like. Um, so here we have our empty hole, with hot dogs with uh, U's on them. Use the whole name, a hot dog is the hole. And the reason it's a hot dog is because I use tech and because I want to have this non-empty hole or something in between the, the, the buns. And uh, that's the non-empty hole. <laughs> and I didn't make any hole jokes, but I am making hot dog jokes. And then uh, we also have type holes. And again, I mentioned earlier, but just to reiterate, type holes behave exactly like gradual typing, unknown, the unknown type and gradual typing. So there's this notion of type consistency that came from a, a great paper by Jeremy Seek and Wally Taha. And we use that same notion to allow you to put something of type hole where there's something of any other type um, that, that's expected there. So it's a little bit like subtyping, but it's not subtyping. It has different properties. So, um, and then, uh, so yeah, tau is the types, e is the expressions, d's are the runtime expressions, and they have to, they're a little different because they have these casts in them. And that's what the cat, the first one there that's highlighted is, is the, the cast form, again, from the gradual typing literature. The second form is the, the, the form for failed casts, and this is what's kind of different from gradual typing, is we actually represent failed casts as terms instead of as like part of the semantics that cause evaluation to stop. And so these behave much like, uh, uh, holes that are generated at runtime. And then the runtime representation of holes, it uh, looks much like the surface representation of holes, but there's this thing sigma, and that thing sigma is the environment, this closure, so like a whole instance plus a closure is, is, uh, is what's represented there. And um, we have, we, you can actually connect this to this uh, theory called contextual modal type theory, which is a, um, a a proof theoretic interpretation of contextual modal logic. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into what that means, but it's this nice theory of like meta variables, which are different from variables because they're given meaning by this contextual substitution operation, which instantiates the free variables with these substitutions, sigma. And what that does is it gives us this really nice like logical interpretation of that whole closure stuff that I showed you. In, um, in the UI. So I just want to point out that there's a lot of beautiful theory, beautiful connections to logic, uh, and, um, and theory can be done not on just programs, but on programming environments and editor services and things like that. So that's what the point of this was. Um, OK, so where am I? OK, so um, this doesn't quite solve the gap problem that, that I told you about, just the static and dynamic semantics for this grammar, because you can still write terms in this grammar that aren't well typed, that don't have the holes in the right place, um, the non-empty holes, for example, in the right place. Uh, this doesn't have the free variable holes, uh, but we added those recently. Um, and so to really get that gap problem to be solved, you also need a semantics of edit actions, these things that I was doing, typing, what, what's the meaning of an edit action? And we have a theory for edit actions as well, and I won't show you any of the like, really 
security details of that, but I'll just point it out with this diagram. There's these edit actions alpha, and as you go along, you, you perform these edit actions in some way. And then the edit states are not just expressions. They're expressions that have types, and that hat on the E means this is also a representation of the cursor. And the guarantee is that the edit actions, as we've defined them, maintain this well-typedness invariant, that they, ins they themselves insert the non-empty holes in the right place so that you can always reason statically according to our semantics about every editor state. And so we actually proved that as a meta-theorem. That's just what PL people call theorems about programming languages. Uh, we call it sensibility, and uh, it just means every edit action leaves the edit state well-typed. And we proved this and a lot of, a lot of other properties using ACTA. So this is uh, a programming environment that we've proven properties about the edit action semantics and the meaning of incomplete programs for. And we call that hazelnut, uh, that core calculus. So hazel is an extension of hazelnut. We don't have all of these editor services, obviously, implemented. We have some of them in some form. Um, but the key ideas are all in hazelnut, right? Like, you can reason statically, you can reason dynamically. You have this language of structured type aware edit actions. And uh, yeah. So that's, uh, that's the sort of the current state of Hazel. I want to now talk a little bit about some of the uh, ongoing and future work that we have planned, which there's a lot of stuff. Uh, one thing is the edit actions in, in the system right now are very low level. Um, so how do we define higher level edit actions? For example, how do we find refactorings and other um, um, program transformations that we can invoke in the editor? How do we do various domain specific edit actions? Like we could imagine some edit action like Saw a cool example in this paper by uh, Jimmy Corcutt at, at Tidy, Tide, Tidy yesterday, or two days ago or something, uh, about like a, an edit action that simplifies a regex right in the editor. So that was pretty cool. Uh, our group at Chicago, Brian Hempel, and a bunch of others are working on this thing called Sketch and Sketch, which some of you might know about, and they have a lot of really cool ideas for high-level edit actions as well. And so, what is the semantics of that um, in terms of low-level edit actions? And then once you have higher-level edit actions. How do you do good like, code completion? Or, or more generally, how do you suggest good edit actions to the programmer in an intelligent way? So I'm sort of generalizing the idea of code completion or program synthesis. I'm saying you don't want to just synthesize code to fill a hole with. You want to synthesize edit actions. You want to suggest that maybe you should do a refactoring, suggest that maybe you should move somewhere else, because that might help answer a question that you have. Right? You might want to move to the next hole or the previous hole or, or something like that. Can that be a part of the um, suggestion box? And also, you can incorporate some of this live inf this uh, closure information directly into the suggestion box and see what this like hypothetical hole filling would actually evaluate to in the current closure. Um, and then maybe we could use machine learning and actually incorporate both like static, uh, like semantic information and uh, learned information about idioms from from code corpuses into the suggestions that are generated. And so, having a theory of incomplete programs allows us to really um, imagine doing that in a good way. Um, so far, I've been sort of giving you this idea of you, you fill holes by doing these, like, it feels very much like coding, right? Like writing text-like stuff. Um, but in some cases, for some data types, it's a lot more natural to construct a value of that type by direct manipulation of a GUI. For example, if you have a, a list of student records, where that's just a record containing five, five fields with grades and names and stuff in it, uh, it'd be nice if we could construct a value of that type using an actual, like, grid, something like an Excel uh, user interface. And so we're working on this idea called palettes, which allows you to um, do hole filling by direct manipulation of, of a GUI that's sort of custom, uh, customly defined for that type. And that GUI itself can have holes in it that you can fill with expressions. So it's not that once you get out of the textual world, you're permanently in the graphical world, and you can never go back. You can go into the graphical world and then back into the textual world and maybe fill one of these holes with another, another palette. And so it's this very compositional view of GUIs is not things that are generated by running a program, but that are part of your program. And maybe for certain users, you just hide all the code and just give them the GUI, but underneath, they're actually programming, actually generating code. And then further down uh, on the page, you actually have a value of type list student rec that you can call map on, you can, call, you can fold over and all that stuff. Um, you can imagine more domain-specific examples of this, like you're trying to do grade cutoffs. Uh, I'm clearly an academic with my examples. Um, and uh, yeah, you want to kind of do these sliders for where the A's and B's are. And, uh, and there, 
we want to actually see some data in the GUI. And so we, we don't want to just fill this like, data hole with the expression weighted averages and then like, blindly select A and B. We want to see the actual value of weighted averages. And we have this hole closure stuff. Right? We actually have some values we can use. So we can actually give the GUI these actual values. And you can select a different closure, and the GUI will change. Uh, and so we're, we're working on this sort of live holes, direct manipulation, GUIs with holes thing. And I've done a bunch of related work on that. I just want to briefly mention it. Um, in, in Eclipse, uh, a few years ago, I did um, the, a very similar thing. You can construct, uh, for example, here a regex value in Java with a, a GUI for constructing regexes with a bunch of helpful things in it, test, test runner and stuff like that. Um, and so that doesn't, that doesn't actually have holes in it. That's just a string box, and you can't put sub-expressions in there. Um, earlier this week at ICFP, I talked about this work on type literal macros. And that's in a purely textual setting in the reason language. Uh, which is a variant, uh, textual variant of OCaml. Uh, but there you can define custom notation for a data type like regex, and then do this thing called, which we call splicing there. It allows you to put sub-expressions in it. And splicing is really putting a hole in a custom notation. And so um, this palettes idea is kind of combining the, the graphite thing I just showed you on the previous slide with this idea, putting it in a graphical setting, and adding live programming to it in a certain sense. OK, I'll stop talking about that. It's my favorite project I'm working on right now. Um, the other thing that um, I haven't mentioned is there are certain editor states that are malformed not because there's a missing expression or an ill-typed expression, but because like it's this weird thing that Git generated. <laughs> and it has conflicts in it. And those like and the editor's like, I don't know what seven equals means. Is that some weird JavaScript thing I don't know about? And uh, and it puts an error thing underneath. And so like, what if instead of representing these things as just text, we represented these conflicts as like holes with multiple things in them and said, OK, I don't know what you want to fill this with, but here are some options from the different branches and stuff. So that would be one option, and I think that's a good idea. Um, we're also just thinking more generally about collaborative editing in Hazel. And, um, and the really the, the key idea for that is, inst what if instead of representing differences between different versions of your programs, uh, of your program as a, a structural diff of the program, what if you represented it as the sequence of edit actions that caused you to go from the first to the second version? Um, that would be a different point of view on it. And we also th we think there's this notion of CRDTs, which is a notion of, it's like a data structure in uh, in the distributed systems community that has this property that like. Uh, the uh, operations on it can come in in any order and you get the same result. So the simplest example is like an increment only counter. It doesn't matter where, you know, in which order the increments come in, you get the same sum at the end. And so what if we could define a system where the actual program, this like type expression in the lambda calculus or something more complicated was a CRDT where the actions were defined such that they could come in in any order and you'd get an equivalent result. So that's not trivial, but we have some ideas about how you could actually do that and really simplify the notion of collaborative editing and, um, and, and versioning by having this convergence property where you don't have to do diffs. You just use these conflict holes sometimes when it's necessary, and those can be resolved. So um, there's, like a, there's tons of other ideas. I, you know, I, I love talking about editors. I know people have lots of opinions about editors. Um, what I really want to conclude with here is um, this kind of vision that we have of like, Imagine a computational Wikipedia where pages weren't just like text and images, but they contained values of a, of a type functional programming language. And you thought of the whole Wikipedia, computational Wikipedia, as a single program being collaboratively edited by hundreds of people using a state-of-the-art semantic editor like this. And, and the, the gap problem would be really serious if you did that naively, right? Because anyone writing 2 plus anywhere would cause the whole wiki to become meaningless. And so, Solving the gap problem, I think, really enables this vision. And I'm going to conclude with just an invitation. Let's build this together. I can't, you know, like, we have a small academic team, but we're totally open to collaborating with anyone who's interested on, the, on, uh, on all, all this kind of stuff. We have a website. Uh, I'm on Twitter. And I'd be happy to take questions. And I'll switch to Slido.